Dr. Andrew Swafford is Associate Professor of Theology at Benedictine College, as well as a noted author, editor, and senior fellow at the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. His wife, Sarah, is a popular Catholic speaker and author in her role as founder of Emotional Virtue Ministries and as a member of the Chastity Project. Together, the Swafford's are raising five beautiful children in the heart of Kansas. In this episode of Sangreal, it was a joy to sit down and celebrate Advent season with the Swaffords as we await alongside our Blessed Mother for the coming of our Lord Jesus. So Andrew and Sarah, thank you both so very much uh, for talking with me today. Uh, we're going to talk about two of uh, our favorite subjects, the Eucharist and our Blessed Mother. And uh, I know... Um, you know, right now is kind of a, it's a special time and it's a busy time, of course, for families with Advent, but uh, I appreciate you both so much. So thank you. Yeah, Thanks thank for you. having us, Paul. It's great to be with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, to start us off, I've got a question for both of you and then we'll just kind of go back and forth, but uh, this one's for both of you. And, and, you know, so you, Andrew, you can, uh, you can start or Sarah, you can start, but the question is, you know, here we are in this time of Advent and uh, preparation for the coming of the Christ child. Can you both speak to how we might use this time to reorient ourselves to have holy families and holy marriages? And how can Eucharistic devotion aid in that? Mm. Mm, that's beautiful. I love that. You go first. No, I go first. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, this, uh, not to go abstract, but uh, the whole liturgical life is to enter into Christ's life, right? So and you see the seasons where, you know, in Advent, we were reliving Israel's story and the longing for Messiah. And, uh, you know, the Eucharist, I mean, I love the quote from Irenaeus that uh, the, the Eucharist confirms our way of thinking and our thinking is attuned to the Eucharist because it, it, it makes our faith a living present reality. Talk about the presence of God, be mindful of the presence of God uh, in the Eucharist. You know, the Paschal mystery, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his the mysteries of his life, they're not the past. They're right here in the present. So I think the challenge for all of us is to slow down, mm -hmm. slow down, take a deep breath, and, and realize the wonder before us mm -hmm. that uh, the veil through which we, you know, pass to the other side of heaven is right before our eyes. And, and Advent just kind of reminds us of these truths that we already know. Yeah. I, I love what he just said, and it's so beautiful. And I think one of the things that um, I really loved, I had a spiritual director one time ask me, so what are you giving up for Advent? And I was like, I'm sorry, what? Because like, I was thinking like, like, isn't that Lent where I have to like, you know, pray and do all these things. And she's, she was like, yeah, but Advent is a time where you prepare, you're preparing as well. So um, she would always encourage me to add something and subtract something. So Advent was kind of, like what's one thing you want to add to your life of prayer and like to your life of, of holiness and what thing you want, one thing you want to subtract that keeps you from that life of holiness. And so I actually find Advent harder to fast during than Lent because Lent, everyone else is doing it with you. Yes. Whereas Advent is like, bring, bring on the, the wine and the cookies and the fun. And uh, yeah. I found it, I have found it to be really hard um, to fast during Advent. And so just, I mean, for for even that to be like okay what are my attachments and what are my things that even you know even it's not a matter of um like I'm, I've been trying to add an extra 30 minutes of prayer to my my day and I find that harder than even just giving up cookies and cake because it's like oh my gosh like where is this extra half an hour going to come from during this busy time and so I think like you said holy families you know the Eucharist all those things it, it's really making space um for a Eucharistic like worldview I mean that's one of the things we love the most about being married, we actually, when we uh, started dating and when we got engaged, we were both college students here at Benedictine College. So we are we live right across the street from Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas, and Andy is a professor there. And um, so when we started dating our junior year of college, one of the things we used to joke about was um, Dr. Shree is one of our professors and he used to talk about um, telos, like Christian end goal like tell us is kind of like you know the end of your goal the end of your the meaning of your life like heaven mm -hmm. and so we used to joke that one of the things that like attracted us to each other was having the same tell us and I just think that that when we think about our lives like the Eucharist like Christ you know just like Swap said you know Christ is you know the way the truth and the life the beginning the end he's the alpha the omega he's all of those things and Advent just helps us to reorient our families our marriages mm -hmm. our lives not only back to it, but 
um, where it should always be. But sometimes you, I mean, the church is genius, genius to have seasons because we get kind of comfortable and we get kind of doing our normal thing. And it's like, it jars you. It's like, yeah, you're doing great, but what can we look at? You know, what can we go deeper with and how the, the, the seasons really help us, I think, to pray and, and kind of figure that out. So I think entering into that as a family as well has been really great. For sure. Oh, that's awesome. And, you know, I mean, yeah, I think you really touched on something, Sarah, too, in terms of the, the need for quiet and kind of, in a sense, entering into that secret life of Mary, right? You know, so she, uh, I remember a, a shameless name dropping here, but I talked with Dr. Miravalli and he was talking about, he was making the point, Mark Miravalli, about, you know, Mary, it's like, you think about it, you go to mass, you have the Eucharist and Jesus physically is in your body, you know, for a short time, but Mary had Jesus within her body like a living tabernacle, of course, for like nine months, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like constant, the, the Eucharistic presence was constantly with her. And so, you know, you think about this time of Advent and I'm with you, Sarah, you know, it's like giving up stuff for Advent, what, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, that was kind of a new concept for me, but I can see the genius of it, you know, in mm -hmm. that turn, in that sense of trying to enter into the silence of Mary, the con mm -hmm. contemplative heart of Mary you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and where that directs us. Cause I think ultimately that's how we can recognize the supernatural in our lives. Um, and I'm the worst at it. And my wife will tell you, cause I'm just like a constant noise and music and it's go, go, go. But mm -hmm. it's that, that silence is what allows God to speak to us. So mm -hmm. amen. Now, Sarah, you know, kind of riffing on that, can you share with us your thoughts on Mary's maternal example on her role in bringing to us the true God and the true man? Yeah, well, it's it's really neat to be, um, I always love it when people ask me about like Mary, especially in connection to Advent, because I have been pregnant with almost all of my babies during Advent, which is, I don't know why that just seems to always have timed up right. <laughs> and um, there's just something really, cool and beautiful about being pregnant during Advent and that, like you said, that maternal, you know, that beauty that it's just something to really behold and reflect on. And, um, but I just think that we were actually just talking about the kids. We were talking about, um, just the whole idea, like even like the wedding, like the wedding feast to Cana and just how the, we were talking about how Mary always, you know, pointed back to Jesus and you know what I mean? Like he she was always pointing people to Jesus and her maternal, her maternal way. Um, and just how, you know, do whatever he tells you. I mean, it's like pointing, 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 do whatever he tells you. And then let me protect you, be your mantle, be your consolation, like your beautiful picture, you know, let me be these things for you in a way, like with a maternal heart. Um, and so I, I just really love that. I, Swaff and I are big fans. Our family is uh, big fans of the chosen, the, the new chosen series that, um, has come out on the app, the chosen app, go get it. You won't be disappointed. Um, a family, good family, you know, friendly type film, which is really hard to find mm -hmm. as we have five children, 15 to two. And so to find something that everybody enjoys, has been really, I mean, it's wonderful, right? Yeah. So, but one of the things that I've really loved about that is just thinking, I love the lives of the apostles and, um, just thinking about them. And I think that we have a lot of similarities to them in our world right now, which is like a world that really doesn't understand or doesn't want to listen or, you know, just. I think that, can you imagine just walking into a place and, and being the first person to tell people about Christ? Like we're getting to that point in our 21st century where, you know, I, I was giving a talk at a high school um, a couple of weeks ago and I, I was giving, you know, in, in my message of relationships and drama and social media and dating, I always say, I don't bait and switch. I bait and hook, right? Cause they all want to talk about that stuff. And then you bring in our Lord at the end and it's like, oh man, this is awesome. You know? So the, but the students, I, I was talking about, I, I kind of talk, I run through like a little thing of like what the gospel is, you know, like our Lord loves you. He died for you, you know, so you'll have eternal life. Like, it's just a quick little thing. And I had a high school boy come up to me at the end and he's like, I really liked your talk. And I was like, thank you. And he was kind of chatting with me about the relationship stuff and his girl problems. And like, we were talking. And then at the end, he looked at me and he goes, and like with the whole like God thing, you know, he's like what exactly is Jesus saving me from? Like, what is the saving thing? Like, what does that, what does that mean? Hmm. And I just thought that was so beautiful because it was such a wake up call to me. Like, so, you know, a Swaps a theology professor, 
I have five kids and I homeschool and, you know, like even all my social media people I follow are all Catholics that are friends of mine and people that I love. And Mm -hmm. like, we're really reaching out and we're in a world where you're walking by people in the supermarket, you're hanging out with people who maybe have never really heard the gospel message before. And so I love, I love watching the chosen and watching them figure it out. How do they figure it out? And then how does Mary, you know, help them when they're having moments of doubt, when they're having moments of insecurity, when they're having moments of fear, mm-hmm. you know, I, I can't wait for them to get to the crucifixion where these same apostles who are like, I will die for you. I, I left everything for you are, are going to deny him and hide. And how's Mary helped them through that? I mean, they're going to, they're going to eventually all look to her, right? The model disciple. So I think just Advent's such a beautiful time to really connect with her and that, you know, her fiat of just like, do whatever he tells you. I did whatever God told me to do. And like, look how beautiful my life has turned out. I didn't always know the plan, but like I'm here, you know? And I feel that way as a mom a lot. And I know Swap feels that way as a dad a lot too. You're like, we're raising these kids and we're doing our best, but we don't, we don't have a blueprint for how to do it. And we don't have a blueprint for what their lives are going to end up like and all the challenges they're going to face and all the successes and the failures they're going to have. So So whether you're a parent out there or a married person or an engaged person or a single person, like Mary can really walk with you in those doubts and fears and insecurities and loneliness that everybody needs. No, absolutely. You know, and it's, I mean, you really, you triggered a thought because, uh, you know, we tend to, I am sure, you know, and I know, I'm sure y'all do. And I know like for our family, you know, you tend to kind of run in the Catholic bubble and you kind of assume everybody just understands the basics of the gospel yeah. and then they just kind of right. either choosing to accept it or not, you know, but then when somebody is like, what am I being saved from? Like, like the concept of sin is just something that, you know, he doesn't, you know, and it, it's like, I mean, my goodness, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of catechesis that can be done, but, you know, of course our blessed mother, you know, I mean, what a great, gift that she is to us that christ gave to us of course you know on the cross his last gift really before he died you know is to give us his mother and you know how she like saint louis de montfort says you know she's like the surest fastest easiest way Mm -hmm. to sainthood you know is follow Mm -hmm. her example is humble and she's so loving and you know it's like she will help you through so now Mm -hmm. and you know, here we are in, in Advent season, you know, kind of t- t- looking at the quote unquote other side of that coin. Can you tell us how Joseph's example of bringing the mother of God into his home is a lesson for us all? Yeah, and I, I think there's a lot of similarities to you, you, you reference Mary, how she ponders all these things in her heart. And, and we've been talking about this, that the fasting, it's not just about like not eating. It's about removing the clutter from our lives. So we can cling to our Lord. And if we're pondering something else, we can't ponder the Lord's. So we, we're all going to be you know, worshiping something, right? So and I look at I look at Joseph and I the uh, I love the title of his. Say Joseph, terror of demons, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you think if the evil one's gonna get into the Holy Family, like it's not through Jesus, it's not through Mary, right? <laughs> so if Joseph shuts the door, man, case closed, game over, right? Right. But how does he do that? I you know, I mean, lots of ways you can look at, it, but I think in the little things behind the scenes, and, and I look as a had. I, I teach theology uh, and I give lectures, I read books, things like that. But like, I think the key to be a dad is being a, you know, a champion in the little things and the champion when the lights are not on the champion, when there's just those little encounters with, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's easy to beat yourself up and, and we're all going to have kind of down moments, but mm-hmm. you know, to be on at home, to be on when no one's looking um, that, you know, JP2, like to say, civilization passes by way of the family. Mm-hmm. It's true. It was true. Then it's true. Now it's always been yeah. true. And St. Joseph, I mean, you see him protecting the Holy Family, going to Egypt, uh, the flight to Egypt. You know, the descriptions of him as a just man, you think about, I, I pray the Shema with my students, uh, the ancient Shema, the hero of Israel, the Lord, our God, Lord is one from Deuteronomy. Think about Joseph teaching Jesus that. Think about him passing, you know, and again, Jesus, the God, man, like, he's true God, but he's also a true man. And so mm-hmm. I, we often talk about Joseph as foster father, but we, and I get why we do that, but he really has a real fatherhood to play. And in the Holy Family becomes kind of an icon of God the Father. And so I, to me, the, the investment in the little things, how important those little things are, and to kind of see the whole world sacramentally, right? I mean, when you read about Joseph, don't just read about this, this quiet man who doesn't have any lines. It's like, no, no, no. Here is like a window that's been revealed to us. Mm. 
about God himself, the holy family as an image of God uh, as triune. So, yeah, in so many ways, but I think the little things behind the scenes, St. Joseph, terror of demons, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the evil one's only way in. And when he's just the door, game over. And the devil usually likes to, his tactics are not usually like big and obvious. Like he's, a, I mean, a, a, a sister, a nun friend of mine calls him silly little red pants, you know, like he, he just likes to be, he likes to be like deceptive and cunning and annoying. And he picks fights that are small and he gets like, you know, families to kind of nitpick at each other or he gets you to kind of, you know, so it's not like, I mean, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I got to, you know, be, you know, prepared for this, this and that. And you're like, totally. But like Swap said, you also have to be prepared for those little ways yeah. that God is going to ask you to die to yourself, that God's going to ask you to protect your family. He's going to ask you to love your family well, like Mother Teresa, you know, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. Because mm. like Swap always says, it's easy to like love when the lights are on and you're on stage or you're, you know, in your life, you're on stage, whatever that means for you. You know, you're, you're at work, you're at school, you're on a mission trip, you're doing all these things that look really holy and cool, mm -hmm. but it doesn't look really holy and cool to like love your family behind closed doors when everyone's losing their minds and you want to like <laughs> hunt everyone out of the house. You know what I mean? Like, you don't, yeah. it's, I mean, we're not speaking from experience at all. No, not at all. But you know what I mean? It's hard to be like, oh, you people are driving me nuts. And um, I just have to like love you well through this. Yeah. Um, but I also, the Holy Family for us, you know, Swap and I are huge St. Saint, Saint Joseph fans. We, started praying to him when we were engaged and we, we, he was kind of our saint patron saint through our whole relationship. We actually gave roses to Lily and, um, I'm sorry, we gave roses to Mary at our wedding and we gave Lily's to St. Joseph. Um, we presented to both of them because they both mean so much to us. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's one of the things that we love about St. Joseph and Mary and the Holy family is just like their presence to Jesus and like how, how he, they were always available to Jesus. And I think that's one of the things that our, our world is really lacking right now is that availability um, and just nothing's more important than people. And I think that, I, I mean, again, I speak with a lot of young adults and especially with social media. And it just seems like, I, I read this really cool thing the other day that said, it was like, a uh, again, on social media, I read a cool thing on social media uh, that said that, I mean, it's like, yeah, I love, I have a love hate with it, you know, but it basically just said that, um, Sometimes social media can make you feel like you're not where you're supposed to be and that you should be somewhere else doing something else. And, and while you're there, you're actually missing what you're actually supposed to be doing. And it was like such a great, like, wow, don't you feel like if you feel so torn, you know, you're like, gosh, I'm not happy with what, like, maybe for the moment, I just want to be distracted. I'm upset. I'm, I need to be, you know, like maybe whatever's going on in your life, you're like, I gotta get out of here. Yeah. A really fast way to do that is to jump on your phone and feel like you're going to be like satisfied or find something there. But typically you put your phone down and you're just back to where you started. And then all of a sudden you feel like you're, you're supposed to be somewhere else and you're not. And I, I just, I feel that angst sometimes with the, like, I think the world feels that sometimes. And um, I think our Lord and the Holy family says, you know, God is not elsewhere. Like God is, God is present. Like God is here. God is now. Um, and, and he wants your attention and he, he's based, he's, you know, pursuing you. Mm -hmm. So what are you looking for? You know, and, um, and, and where do you think you're going to find that? And a lot of it is just that, again, that looking to the Holy family, that slowing down, that being present. Um, and, and what a great time to, to really reflect on all of that during Advent. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I had a little bit of a God moment. Cause I was, as you were talking, I was thinking about, um, we had, um, an interview with a nun and she was talking about how she's getting uh, the term frustration out of her vocabulary because what she finds with, when she gets frustrated is, is essentially she turns her focus inward on herself and as opposed to, you know, focusing on God. And, and you know, you're right, Sarah. I mean, how often are we, you know, what, what's been kind of bouncing around in my head the last couple of days is being too busy for people. I'm too busy for people, right? I don't give them the attention or the focus because I've got all this other stuff going on. And, you know, and of course, who, who gets the worst of it is, is the family, right? Because those are the people that count on you the most and mm -hmm. God has placed them in your life, um, you know, to take care of. So, so, you know, Andrew, so this next question is on that, you know, with so much confusion being sown in the world today regarding what is right and wrong. And I'm sure like, like Sarah, I'm sure you get hit with it all the time as you're speaking to high schools and colleges and why this? Why that? You know, and even within the church, 
you know, it's got to be said, there's a lot of confusion within the church, you know, uh, what's right and what's wrong. You know, Andrew, what are your thoughts on how to insulate our families from erroneous teachings? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> so on the one hand, we, we, need, we need right teaching. Okay, everybody knows that. But we can't just do that. It's not enough just to be orthodox. It's not just to do that. I think especially as the kids go, get older, uh, their friends are massive. I think any parent knows this as they hit that 11, 12, 13. Like if they can have friends that are on the same page with them. And so they, you know, because there's this kind of inferiority complex, right? I'm alone. I'm the only one. It's a global call. And uh, the, 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 no one wants to feel alone, but if they have friends, they can create a new normal. Mm -hmm. I think um, just on the whole, though, as I said, not just right teaching, mm -hmm. we need to cultivate right practices, right devotions, right experiences, whether it's kind of serving the poor or a soup kitchen, praying the rosary, or frankly, even reading Narnia or something like that to not just you know, teach the mind, but till the heart, mm -hmm. uh, till the heart so that we're, we really come to appreciate, respect, and admire, want to emulate virtue, mm. and we can see vice for what it is. When, I, when my kids were little, the kinds of uh, things that I despised the most is when the, the good guy was kind of bad and the bad guy was kind of good, that kind of moral amb ambiguity. I mean, I just, I, I just hated that. And, and as they get older, you can have more discussions. But uh, something like Narnia, where there's you have bad characters, and there's characters who develop, like, you know, Edmund and Eustace. And, and I'm just, it's not just Narnia, but... but good stories whether it's good movies good tv shows good literature whatever it is and then good friendships that, that are kind of um, you know lots of good conversations you can have fun mm -hmm. but i i just it's sort of like if your soul is like a pond and there's streams flowing into it mm -hmm. if those streams are dirty you're gonna have a heck of a time keeping that pond clean right so what's flowing in downstream not just like intellectually, but what's forming my mind, my heart, my conversations, my friendships. I think the game is, I don't know. I mean, I don't 80% played right there because that tills the ground for catechesis to stick. Whereas, you know, I teach a lot of college students and a lot of incredible students. And some people, sometimes they have incredible conversions. But I'd say often, more often than not, if it's just hitting the head and there's not a group of friends with them, if there's not people kind of following up, yep. walking with them, accompanying yep. them, yep. It, it's it's less and less likely that it's going to really stick for the long mm -hmm. haul. Well, when you think about, I was just thinking about what he said, we love talking about this, is um, like the, he said the global, you know, what was so different about 100 years ago or 150 years ago is you lived in a town with maybe 100 people and those 100 people you know typically most of them probably have the same somewhat moral beliefs as you you know probably had a very similar even faith background as you you know even if you were maybe a catholics and protestants and you know you may but you saw kind of the same worldview of like virtue and ethics and things like that um but like swap just said now with social media and media and just in general you you feel like you can feel like i live in my house I don't know my neighbors. I go to church maybe 30 minutes away. I go into church. I walk out of church. Mm -hmm. I have no friends that are Catholic. I don't really have, my family doesn't really practice. Um, you know, I don't really know what I believe. Like most of my friends don't believe what I believe. I don't even know what I believe. The church says this, but I have no one that's really going to talk to me about that. So I'm, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just so easy. I think in our, like, especially as you're raising kids or just, you know, even your own mind, yeah. It can be so easy to feel alone and feel like I don't even know where to go for answers anymore because there's so many different points of view. Whereas I think it was a little easier 100, 150 years ago because, I mean, if you wanted an answer, you just walked the street in town one or, you know, it's just like everyone kind of breathed the same air. Whereas in our day and age, I mean, that's not, that's not true at all. Yeah. And so when you said, how do we kind of protect our families and stuff? It's like, you, I mean, there's no way, there's no way that we're going to be able to you know, the walled city thing. I mean, you're, you're, there's just, people are still going to come and go and that's just not our society anymore. But that means we have to be even stronger, like Swap said, on this intellectual heart, the heart, the mind, and the relationships, the friendships, whether it's, you know, families that we run with and, you know, it's like, well, like our kids, we run with, you know, a bunch of couples and with their kids, we have them over and we hang out and we're like, well, at least they know that there's other, there's five other sets of crazy radical parents that don't let you get, don't let you do what they don't get to do either. You know I mean? At least they know that mom and dad aren't the only crazy ones that don't let them have, you know, X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Um, does that make sense? Like, I don't know. I'm just trying to say, I think it really has a lot to do with those relationships. I mean, Swap is hitting it right well, on. And for the parents out there, I mean, don't, 
don't beat yourself up and say, what if, 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 you know, because anything can happen. And I think surrender to the Lord, yeah. pray to St. Monica, mm -hmm. uh, and just wherever, wherever your kids are, whether they're grown and gone or, or the struggles right now, just how can I make this one level up? How can I move one level closer? How can I keep that line of communication open mm -hmm. and play the long game? Yeah. Because lots of, lots and lots of things can happen. Uh, and I know we all know this, but it's, it's easy to kind of beat yourself up and say, hindsight's 2020, should have been this, this, and this. It just focus on the present. Uh, and how can, I, how can I bring them at least one level up from where they are? Right. Yeah, and I think it's the challenge is you want to, we live in an age, you know, uh, where you want to be able to walk with people and you want to meet them where they're at, right? Because that's what a loving heart will do is to try to meet people where they're at, but you can't leave them there, you know? So it's like sure. the loving heart is actually going to be, hey, you know, there is a better way. There, there's a better yeah. way. Yeah. I don't have all the answers. Like I'm a messed up person too. So I'm not trying mm -hmm. to judge you, but I do know in my own walk that when I went, this way it wasn't working for me and when i decided to go <laughs> this way I got right, right 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 no so and do we love them enough to speak the hard truths yeah i mean that's the, that, that's as, as fathers as mothers with, with my students i mean every every teacher every preacher every parent you want there's a temptation want to be liked mm -hmm. do i love them enough to speak the hard truths and i think the challenge for us especially today is to raise kids with conviction mm -hmm. where, where they i mean they they, they they know the truth in their head and their heart yeah. Yet they're comfortable in their own skin in season out of season. What I mean is, can, can they be themselves in a different environment? So they might there might be an echo chamber. There might be a kind of a you know a, a kind of a sheltering when they're younger. Mm. Will they be confident in their own skin when they leave that? And can they navigate the world and, and not hate the world? Mm -hmm. Not hate the world. Not be scared uh, of it. And, and not be scared of it. Not hate it and maintain conviction. Yep. I think that's the great chance. It's almost like if you're going to get along with the world, you got to you know, throw your conviction yeah. at the door, right? Or, or you just kind of ghetto and you just say, I hate the world and I won't talk to anybody else. <laughs> ghetto, and I, 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 join a gang. That works for a while, <laughs> but I just don't think the law. And, and, it doesn't work forever. You know, and a, yeah. a priest friend said this, like, we'll change the culture when your grandkids are Catholic. And so I just don't think the kind of super defensive mentality is going to work for more than one generation, even one. So I think to cultivate conviction, yeah. um, that doesn't that doesn't just play the us and them game. Yes, there's always there a little bit, but um, that has the confidence to just run to Jesus and not be afraid of the world and not be insecure because insecurity is what leads to defensiveness often. Yeah. Well, and it's I, again I point back to our Blessed Mother because her example she's so gentle, right? Yeah. That it makes it so much easier to just be like just go to Mary. <laughs> you know, and invoke, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, the mother's touch, you know, and it's like, it, it doesn't come across quite as, you know, maybe as judgy or, or whatever. Cause then it's yeah. like, it's love and it's saying yes yeah. to God and starting there. But, yeah. Amen. Uh, yeah. So, um, I know, uh, I, you know, uh, this, this last question, I, I'm going to ask you both, uh, and I'm being respectful of your time. So I know we've, we've got a lot of family obligations and stuff. So I want to, <laughs> yeah, crazy. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm trying to watch the clock, but um, no, you're good. My last question is for both of you: is what is your wish for this Christmas season, and as we prepare for the new year? Oh, that's so good. You go first. You go. Sure. You know, I, I mean, we've talked about it a couple of times, but I think um, slow down. Um, I it's just kind of a firm opinion of mine that the cause of secularism, not just out there, but like in my own part, is busyness. I, I just think it. It suffocates, it chokes the seed of that word, the, the growth of that seed is our Lord in the parable. When I have a student who's struggling with their faith, someone will ask, you know, when was the last time you looked at the stars at night? Mm. When was the last time you just kind of enjoyed the beauty for its own sake and didn't didn't read a book just for the sake of a talk or didn't, you know, get, waste time on your, I mean, just like, just breathe in reality. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, even my own life, when it's like one thing to the next, it just chokes out that, it chokes out that Marian dimension. Mm -hmm. Right, that Marian dimension of engaging the real and being with the Lord and and pondering all things in her heart. Mm -hmm. I just think if we can do anything, we'll do so much if we can find a way to slow our hearts down, even if our lives keep the same pace they are. Uh, yeah, I agree. I'll piggyback on that. Um, we we just entered a really we we're we're hopefully exiting a really busy time 
we um we just uh, renovated this old house we're uh, in an 1883 house that we bought that's uh two blocks from adoration in our church and mm. two blocks from benedictine from andy's um work so we, this house came open that was close to everything and it was like let's do it but it has <laughs> been so much work um so anyway it's just you know busy when you remodel and then COVID hit and it was like even harder so and then last week um our rental house our old house we started renting out to college students and we had a house fire, um, the dehumidifier caught on fire and it like burnt our plumbing and our electrical and our HVAC. And so the girls got displaced and it has just been one of those, like, like I'm sitting here talking about all this and it's like, we're talking to ourselves, right? You know, like, I mean, this is one of those seasons that are busy. Yeah. So one, one of the things that I've been, my wish for Christmas break and what we've been praying about a lot is just like not letting good become the enemy of the best. Because there's so many goods in our life. Like Swaff and I are so blessed. Like we have so many goods and, you know, like for a lot of people out there that are feeling lonely and, you know, things like that. It's like, I just want to give them some of my friends because I have so many amazing friends, but I also feel like, you know, it's hard to say no. It's hard to say no to, to things that are fun, things that are great, things that are exciting. It's, it's hard to say no to opportunities or when our kids are like, let's do it. I'm like, we do not have time to do it. You know what I mean? Like there's so many great things, but but we're really praying through not letting good become the enemy of the best, because I think that our Lord that's, and you have to pray to know what is best because everything looks good. And so that discernment is really important. And so I think busyness, like my prayer for Christmas and Advent is just to, to, you know, tone it down so I can hear the Lord better um, and really take time to, to quiet my heart so that I can hear him more clearly. I think that's really, that would be my, way. also just to get really good, like, it's kind of nice when the world stops for a week or two where everyone's like, Oh, I'm sure everybody's with their families. It's like, we are, let's everybody just go do your thing so that, you know what I mean? It's kind of nice. Um, kind of like those two weeks during COVID when everyone was quarantined, it was kind of nice, um, to be like, no, nope, sorry, we can't, you know? And I feel like the, the, the holidays are kind of like that too, you know, with mm -hmm. things kind of slow down, there's not as many activities and outside of the home. And so if we're just, I mean, that's my prayer for everyone is just to really not take this, break for granted and to really dig deep and ask the Lord how to reorient our lives as we start a new year, mm -hmm. as we start, you know, Christmas season, which hasn't started yet. Um, <laughs> just for everybody in the back, right. The, the Advent season we go Christmas. So, um, but yeah, thanks for asking us and, uh, please know that we're praying for you and all of your listeners and, and that y'all have just such a fruitful, um, Advent remaining Advent and Christmas. Amen. Praise be the Lord Jesus well, Christ. Well, Andrew and Sarah, thank you both so very much. I really appreciate it. It's been a, a beautiful time to spend with you and uh, blessings and prayers for you and the Swafford family. And thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. God bless you. All right. You too.